Ryan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Last time we evaluated two popular single translator Bibles, the Message and the Passion Translation. This time we're switching gears to consider committee-based versions. I want to shine a spotlight on the whole subject of bias in translation in an effort to point out what often goes unnoticed. We'll consider both the committee effect that tends to eliminate non-traditional renderings as well as how the concept of sola scriptura, that's scripture alone, exerts immense pressure on evangelicals to nudge their translations in the direction of their doctrinal commitments. Here now is episode 347, part 18 of our Bible class, Bias in Bible Translation. All translations are susceptible to bias, okay? We're humans. Translations are made by humans. We all have this potential flaw where we read in our own bias into something. However, dynamic equivalence versions are at greater risk for translation bias than formal equivalence versions. And this is because they add extra layers of interpretation. The formal equivalence people look to mirror the text. So if the text is a little bumpy here and uh, a little deep over here, they want to mirror that terrain, the, the very form of it, in their translation. Whether they even understand it fully or not is not the primary question they ask. The primary question is how do we render the same phrase into English? Whereas the dynamic equivalence people add in two extra layers. One, they really want to understand what that phrase means. And so they're interpreting it themselves in, it, in whatever the original language is. And then number two, they want to find a way to make that English such that it communicates clearly to people without ambiguity today. So those two extra layers of interpretive work in dynamic equivalence versions, on the one hand, make them much more readable and some may even argue more enjoyable, <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, they allow the translator's beliefs to, in a sense, get injected into the final product of Scripture itself. Here's how David Bentley Hart put it. Most of them, translations he's talking about here, hide sometimes forcibly things of absolutely vital significance for understanding how the text's authors thought. At times, this is a result of the peculiarities of the translator's linguistic, historical, or conceptual training. More often, it is the result of their commitment to one or another specific theological tradition or predisposition. And occasionally, it is the result of their loyalty to some prevailing theory of translation, such as dynamic equivalence theory, that encourages them to make the line between translation and interpretation perilously hazy. And this is really our concern today is this perilously hazy line between what does Scripture say and what is the translator's interpretation of what Scripture says. And this is where bias is able to get a foothold. Have you ever seen rose-colored glasses? These are glasses that filter out certain undesirable characteristics of light and also filter in others. With respect to Bible translation, the translators are wearing the glasses of their own beliefs. And look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. It's just, this is just the way we all are. We're all wearing the glasses of our own beliefs when we come to read a text. But then they interpret scripture in light of that, and a lot of times they find scripture saying what they thought it should say, in the end when they, re when they produce their translation. So let's look at a couple of quick examples of this from two of the most popular dynamic equivalence versions out there. We're going to look at the NLT and the NIV. And first up is John 17.3, which reads in the NASB, which is a very, very literal translation, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is almost an exact translation of what the Greek says above. Whereas the NLT reads, and this is the way to have eternal life. So this is their interpretation right here. Instead of saying this is eternal life, they say this is the way to have eternal life. They add in that interpretive element. They go on. 
to know you, that this is the NLT again, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. There, there is no to earth in the Greek or the NASB. Uh, the NLT just added in these two words, to earth. Uh, what the Greek actually says is, whom you sent Jesus Christ. The NLT says, Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I looked at other translations. I, I have access to about roughly two dozen English translations, a handful of German, French, Latin. I have the Latin Vulgate, uh, of course, the original Greek. I could find no other translation, I mean none, that adds in these words to earth. And that, you know, that might be something for you to consider when you, when you come across a verse that s seems to be a little different. Compare other translations and see, does anybody else do this too? Because look, the NLT is being radical, it's being controversial here, it's adding in here more than anyone else is adding in. So we have to ask the question, do they have a legitimate point or are they just overstepping here? So what's going on? Well, the word sent, as in English, so in Greek, can have multiple meanings. Uh, the NLT people believe this verse is talking about God physically sending Jesus to the earth. They think it's a, a, a sending in the sense of something physical. However, it can just as well mean commissioning, as it does in John chapter 1, verse 6. And this verse reads, this is the NASB, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. And that is essentially a, a literal reading of the Greek here. However, the NLT reads, God sent a man, John the Baptist, okay? And uh, so they added in the Baptist. That's, it does not say that in the original Greek because they wanted clarity. They didn't want you to think it was John the Apostle or some other John. Uh, I don't really have any problem with that, to be honest. Uh, but what they did here is instead of saying a man sent from God, they reworked that phrase to God sent a man, and this breaks the parallel between these two passages from the interpreter. So when you're reading John 17, 3, for example, and you read uh, Jesus Christ whom he sent, and then you go over to John 1, 6, and instead of, saying, instead of saying a man sent from God, it just says God sent a man. It, it does break the parallel a little bit there. And if anything, in John 1, 6, this language is even more suggestive. Uh, because rather than just saying in sort of a, a general sense whom he sent or whom was sent, whatever, uh, now we have sent from God. Well, where does God dwell? He dwells in heaven. Doesn't this verse clearly say that John the Baptist was physically sent to the earth? No. No, it does not say that John the Baptist, nobody, to my knowledge, nobody believes that John the Baptist lived in heaven before he came to the earth, okay? Nobody believes that. But yet the language is not only similar, but it's even more suggestive in this verse than in the other verse, and yet the NLT went out of their way to rework the, the sentence so that it wouldn't imply that kind of sending. What kind of sending is implied? Well, it's clear. Commissioning. He sent John, just like he sent the prophets, he sent other people to do different jobs throughout the Bible, and so there's no reason to add in to the earth here. But in John 17, 3, the NLT believes that it's not talking just about commissioning, which is non-controversial. Everyone would agree that God sent Jesus in the sense that he commissioned Jesus to do the work that he did. But that it also refers to him uh, living in heaven and then coming down to the earth, which the text could mean, but it does not explicitly say. And I think you can argue it doesn't really implicitly say either. It just says that whom he was sent. It's a, it's a phrase that could mean multiple things. Uh, but this example shows us how the NLT removes ambiguities, a phrase that can mean multiple things, and instead replaces them with its own preferred interpretation. And that's their standard operating procedure in translation, sort of like baked into their translation philosophy. Now let's take a look at another example, this time from the NIV, in Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So from the moment he was born, he was sinful. This, this sounds to me like the doctrine of original sin. It seems like it's enforcing that idea. Whereas the Hebrew does not read that way. What the Hebrew reads, and this is from the Catholic New American Bible here, Behold, I was born in guilt, in sin my mother conceived me. Do you see the difference there? 
in one case, it sounds like the sin was David's as a baby. In the other case, it sounds like the sin was David's mother's in the act of conception. The NIV transfers the sin to David in line with the doctrine of original sin, which evangelicals generally believe, and the NIV, as we'll see, was done by people who agreed to an evangelical statement of faith. Robert Alter explains this issue nicely. In his book, The Art of Bible Translation, he addresses this. He writes, Christian interpreters through the ages have understood this verse as a prime example of the doctrine of original sin. It may, however, be unwarranted to construct a general theology of sinful human nature from this verse. The speaker of this poem certainly feels permeated with sinfulness. He may indeed trace it back to the sexual act through which he was conceived, but there is not much here to support the idea that this is the case of every human born. I can tell you this, that in the New American Bible, the footnote reads as follows. The verse does not imply that the sexual act of conception is sinful. <laughs> so, uh, according to the Catholic's own Bible, they're saying that this verse, Psalm 51.5, is not saying that the act of uh, sex itself is sinful, uh, but they're also not translating it in line with the doctrine of original sin. So, what, what does this all say to me? This says to me that there are a few interpretation possibilities for Psalm 51.5. One is that it is supporting the doctrine of original sin. One is that it's condemning procreation as sinful. And another is that it's just hyperbole. It's, it's the poet expressing himself in an exaggerated manner to make the point that he, he's like, oh, I'm so sinful. It's, it's like I, from the womb I've been permeated with sin. Um, there's lots of different ways you could think about it, but the problem I'm pointing out here with the NIV is that the NIV, NIV takes away all those options, really almost forcibly changes what the Hebrew says so that it reads in a way that is in line with their own theological and doctrinal commitments. And that's precisely what concerns me. What's more, this problem, we just looked at two dynamic equivalence versions, is not confined to just that one translation philosophy. Formal equivalence versions likewise struggle with this same issue of bias injecting into their translations, uh, presumably unknowingly. I, I'm not going to attribute malicious intent to the translators here, um, but this is, this is a rather insidious thing. It's probably because there's a way that tradition affects committee-based translations, okay? And this, this might not be obvious to you, but David Bentley Hart explains it very nicely. He writes the following. The inevitable consequence of this, decisions made by committees, is that many of the most important decisions are negotiated accommodations achieved by general agreement and favoring only those solutions that prove the least offensive to everyone involved. You have a committee. Let's say you have one translator. Let's say this person has two PhDs in ancient Semitic languages, has uh, deciphered ancient texts, done archaeology, and just has all the chops of a phenomenal translator. And this person comes forward and says, I think it should read this way. Now the committee reviews it, and the committee says, wow, that's, that's out there. That is, that is a brand new idea. We've always translated it like this. The other mainstream translations that we have all also do it this way. Uh, you know, can you move it a little bit over from what you're suggesting? Uh, and so you have these accommodations, these dialogues, these compromises that come in so that the committee will approve the translation suggestion of the real scholar who is doing the work behind the scenes. He goes on to say, this becomes in effect a process of natural selection, this is really fascinating, in which novel approaches to the text are generally the first to perish and only the tried and trusted survive. And this can result in the exclusion not only of extravagantly conjectural readings, but often of the most straightforwardly literal as well. In the end, even the most conscientious translations tend, at certain crucial junctures, to use language determined as much by theological and dogmatic tradition as by the plain meaning of the words on the page. And in some extreme cases, doctrinal or theological or moral ideologies drive translators to distort the text to a discreditable degree. Certain popular translations, 
like the New International Version and the English Standard Version are notorious examples of this. This may represent the honest zeal of devout translators to communicate what they imagine to be the quote-unquote correct theology of Scripture, but the preposterous liberties taken to accomplish this end often verge on a kind of pious fraudulence. He lumps in the NIV and the ESV. So the NIV is, is uh, dynamic equivalence. Over the years, I would argue that it's moved more and more towards a formal equivalence, that a lot of the more... Uh, loose translations that they've done. They've edited over the years and it's kind of moved more towards the formal side, although it still is within the dynamic uh, half of the spectrum. And then the ESV is like the most literal translation, at least by some, some measurements, that you have. And, and he's lumping them both in and says, oh, these guys do this all the time. You know, they inject their belief their, their, or their morals into Scripture so that it reads the way they want it to read rather than just straightforwardly translating it. And he's suggesting that this is all a result of just the, the practicalities of doing things in a committee, whereas single author translations, you know, they just put it the way they think it should be. They don't have to argue about it with a whole team of people and publishers who are worried about selling this thing or theologians who are worried about how this is going to affect systematic theology or pastoral ministry. You know, there's a lot of complications that come into this. Uh, now, some of you may be uncomfortable with me quoting Robert Alter. This is his book on uh, Bible translation here. Uh, Robert Alter is a, non, is a non-Christian. He's, he's a Jewish scholar and author. Uh, some of you might be uncomfortable with me quoting uh, David Bentley Hart. He's an Orthodox Greek Christian, comes from a very different perspective. Maybe some of you are uncomfortable with me quoting the New American Bible, uh, which is a Catholic translation, or the NRSV, which is generally rejected by evangelicals and only accepted by mainliners and secular universities. But why am I bringing these different sources into the picture? It's because the only way you can see bias is by having somebody with a different bias look at the same thing, translate the same thing. So if we, if we, see, if we only look within evangelical translations, we're going to see similar things over and over and over again. And you might be fooled to think, well, this one's formal and this one's dynamic. Yeah, but they both, if they both all agree on the same presuppositions for what their doctrines are, or at least the big ones, then what I'm saying is you can't even help but read those into the text. It's just, it's just baked into your presuppositions, your, your own bias. Uh, and so the contrast is what we need to see where there is bias and where there isn't bias, and that's what I'm commending to you. And we're, we're, we'll see this more as I get into specific examples. We're going to look at five examples uh, in subsequent videos. Now, for the record, me quoting a Bible version doesn't mean that I endorse it. If I'm quoting a Bible version, I'm, I'm doing it for a specific reason. In fact, uh, just previous, uh, two, the two previous episodes to this one, I quoted extensively from the King James Version, the Message Bible, and the Passion Translation, and I don't think that those translations are very good, at least not by today's standards, and I don't even think you should really be reading them, unless you're an expert in the original languages or an expert in uh, Old English or something like that. Uh, so I think you have to be recognize that I'm not, I'm not endorsing these different versions. I'm using them for a specific purpose to show different things. Uh, we can get to later on evaluating translations and figuring out what's good, but right now our topic is bias. And the simple fact is bias is hard to detect, especially if you have the same bias as your translation. And I want to talk about how translations go about forming these committees. Say, for example, the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. This is a denominational translation of the Southern Baptist Convention, right? So what kinds of translators are going to be involved? People within that denomination. The New World Translation is the denominational translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The JPS Translation, the Jewish Publication Society, that is for Jewish, done by Jewish people for Jewish people. It's just going to have that, that angle on it, that spin on it, if you will. Uh, the New American Bible is also a single denomination translation. It's Roman Catholic. So it, it's helpful to see what the bias is going in so that we can compare them against each other. But even translations that have multiple denominations, 
they still have bias in them. And that's because they usually limit those uh, doing the work of translation and decision making in the committee to people who have the same overarching outlook on Christianity as they do. Or and, and to put it another way, the same overarching dogmas. Now when I say dogma here, I'm not trying to be insulting, but I'm using it as a set of beliefs that are not allowed to be questioned. That's how I'm using the term dogma. Uh, and you don't have to be a conservative to have dogmas. You could, you could be a liberal theologian and have just as many dogmas as a conservative theologian. Uh, they're just different commitments that you have. So, for example, the, uh, the NRSV is the product of mainline denominations like uh, Episcopalians, Presbyterian Church USA, United Methodist Church, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and so on and so forth. These kinds of mainline denominations are the ones that tend to use the NRSV and that the NRSV is pulling from to, uh, to get a team of translators together, right? So guess what? It's going to have those ki that kind of a flavor in its translation. Now, I'm not trying to get into the, the nitty-gritty here, but so it is with the NIV on the other side of it. The NIV, they invited scholars from evangelical denominations and non-denominations. In fact, the NIV required translators to sign a statement of faith in order to work on the project. So even though they had over a hundred or however many it was translators in the original NIV, there was still only a team of 15 theologians who had the final say on everything. So why, why is a theologian deciding what the Bible says? I, I've got major problems with that. The Bible is supposed to say what the theologians think, not the other way around. That to me is scary. Uh, or likewise, the NLT said the following on their translation team. This is from their website. In order to guard against personal and theological biases, the scholars needed to represent a diverse group of evangelicals who would employ the best exegetical tools. They recruited teams of scholars that represented a broad spectrum of denominations, theological perspectives, and backgrounds within the worldwide evangelical community. Here, here, here's their statement. This is like their big moment for the NLT to say, oh, we're trying to fight bias. That's, what they're, that's the purpose of this statement. And in, in their effort of trying to make the case that they're fighting against bias, they admit twice that they only consulted translators within the overall umbrella or tent of evangelicalism. As if, your, as if your commitments to your different doctrines affect your linguistic ability. So, they, since they never pursued talent outside the umbrella of evangelicalism, evangelicalism is baked into the NLT. And uh, look, if you have all the same beliefs as mainstream evangelicals, then hey, you're going to be like, wow, this Bible says everything I thought it should say. But is that really the way we want to you know, treat our source? for our, our belief and our practice of Christianity, just like bake in everything from the start and there's, nobody can argue about it? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I have a real issue with this methodology. And this all brings us to the issue of um, the evangelical burden. Now, Catholics and mainliners, they have a little bit more freedom to allow the Bible to say whatever it happens to say. So, for example, uh, Roman Catholics don't, they don't have this pressure to like... Um, have all of their beliefs be found directly in Scripture. They have other means by which beliefs are decided upon. Councils, church tradition, uh, the Pope can speak ex cathedra. You know, there, there are lots of different ways within Catholicism for beliefs to be decided upon and to emerge. They don't have to, they don't have this doctrine of like sola scriptura like Protestants do. And mainliners likewise, for different reasons, don't feel a big pressure to find every one of their beliefs within Scripture. However, evangelicals, Bible-believing Christians, must find their beliefs in Scripture. That's just part of what it means to be an evangelical. And this is really interesting. This is what Jason David Badoon said about that. He wrote, Protestant forms of Christianity following the motto of sola scriptura, Scripture alone, insists that all legitimate Christian beliefs and practices must be found in, or at least based on, the Bible. That is a very clear and admirable principle. 
The problem is that Protestant Christianity was not born in a historical vacuum and does not go back directly to the time of, that the Bible was written. Protestantism was and is a reformation of an already fully developed form of Christianity, Catholicism. When the Protestant Reformation occurred just 500 years ago, it did not reinvent Christianity from scratch, but carried over many of the doctrines that developed within Catholicism over the course of the previous thousand years and more. In this sense, one might argue that the Protestant Reformation is incomplete and that it did not fully realize the high ideals that were set for it. Protestantism says scripture alone, but Protestantism didn't apply scripture alone to all of its beliefs, only to certain beliefs, like the uh, justification by faith and so on. Those of you who know church history, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, these kinds of reformers, you know, they had narrow focuses. Not to say they didn't, they weren't consciously aware of other doctrines, uh, but they didn't apply the principle of scripture alone to everything. They had inherited a lot from Catholicism. They adjusted some, but they didn't reevaluate everything is what Badoon is saying here. He goes on, for the doctrines that Protestantism inherited to be considered true, they had to be found in the Bible. And precisely because they were considered true already, there was and is tremendous pressure to read those truths back into the Bible, whether or not they are actually there. Translation and interpretation are seen as working hand in hand and is practically indistinguishable because Protestant Christians don't like to imagine themselves building too much beyond what the Bible spells out for itself. So, even if most, if not all, of the ideas and concepts held by modern Protestant Christians can be found, at least implied, somewhere in the Bible, there is a pressure, conscious or unconscious, to build up those ideas and concepts within the biblical text to paraphrase or expand on what the Bible does say in the direction of what modern readers want and need it to say. So this is what we're going to be looking at in future episodes. I want to examine five cases where bias intrudes on translation. I use only these two fairly trivial examples, one from John 17.3 and Psalm 51.5, just to show you a general sense of this. But I want to get a little bit more specific and show you five of these areas where I believe there is bias in translation. And also my goal is to train you so that you have a trained eye and you can figure these things out on your own. Even if you don't have access to original languages, you haven't, you haven't studied them, by looking at translations from different perspectives on that same verse, we can still find out what's going on within the English language. So next time I invite you to join me as we look at Philippians 2 and ask the question, God's form or God's nature? And uh, we'll do that next time in our continuing quest to understand how we got the Bible. All right, well, that's it for this time. Please come on over to restitudio.org if you'd like to support this ministry or if you'd like to leave a comment or question on episode 347 here about bias in Bible translation. We'd love to hear any specific examples that you have of bias that you're aware of that I could incorporate in future episodes. I also wanted to read out a comment from Mark from part 16, evaluating the King James Version, who writes, I was happy to hear that you will cover the Passion Translation in your next episode, as this so-called translation is barely being covered anywhere else, yet is gaining in popularity in many NAR churches. Not a great development, I would say. NAR, for those of you who are not familiar, stands for New Apostolic Reformation. It's kind of like a charismatic designation. Mark continues, I would highly recommend Mike Winger's videos on this subject, who has put a lot of research into this topic. Perhaps you were already aware of them, as there isn't a lot of other material to be found. But if not, then it might be helpful to check them out. Then he adds in a couple of YouTube links. And so by way of response to Mark here, my evaluation wasn't so much based on uh, Brian Simmons' theology uh, as it was on his translation and evaluating specifically how well he was able to retain the line between translation and interpretation. And what we saw on that is that he didn't maintain that line at all. He freely injected his own interpretation. I showed the example from Song of Songs and a number of others. 
where he freely inserted his own beliefs into the Bible. And so that's a real limitation of this style of translation. I, too, noticed that there was just so little out there about the Passion Translation, even though I know folks that have quoted it in recent history, and so that's why I decided to get into it. But I'm, I'm glad uh, you found it helpful, or I hope, I guess, that you found it helpful since you left this comment before I put out that episode. Um, I'll take a look at these other videos. I haven't really investigated much the NAR or NAR, I don't know how you say that, movement. I know that I've seen people use that term in reference to Bethel Church, and uh, that, you know, healing and miracles and this sort of thing. So I, I'd be curious to look into that a little bit more. As far as my own belief, as far as historic Christianity goes, I think it's it's very clear that the earliest Christians did believe in miracles, did see miracles. Uh, Jesus was a healer in his ministry. That's clear. He cast out demons. The apostles did the same. This kind of practice did continue in the second century, in the third century, and so on uh, throughout church history, diminishing as time went on. Um, but um, it is certainly something that I believe you can't say ended with the apostles. Uh, now, I'm not sure if that's the same thing as what we're talking about here, so I'll have to look into it, but I appreciate you bringing it up and for your comments on this episode, Mark, from the Netherlands. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time, and remember, the truth has nothing to fear.